Today I'm talking YouTube, so if you're interested in growing on YouTube, this is for you. Hello, I'm Olivia D'Souza. I'm a multi-passionate entrepreneur. I'm a content and podcast expert. I support visionary entrepreneurs and leaders passionate about living with purpose. Join me as we explore podcasting, life, business, and authenticity. Subscribe for meaningful conversations with a business buddy who gets what it's like. Welcome to Magnetic Pod. I'm stepping in the next level. Right, so I thought what I'd do today is talk about YouTube and share a bit about my own journey with my own channel. Uh, that way I don't have to get permission from anyone else to talk about their channels. So I have been lucky enough to learn a lot about YouTube from some of the best and biggest YouTubers in Australia. And I felt like it was a waste that I wasn't doing it for myself. So Late last year, about September, it was September 22nd, I think, that I hit publish on on a particular YouTube video, which was the Finger Family YouTube video, is when I've been doing YouTube properly, I say in air quotes. <laughs> uh, so uh, before that, there was, uh, so what it is, it's Livy Kids Music. And I, in another life another part of my life is creating children's music and I have an album and I have this version of myself where I used to do live and I might get into it again but I haven't been doing it for quite a while where I wear a, a red wig and wear some uh, bright white and red uh, clothes and sparkly shoes and I sing my music all about empowering uh, music for children to build up their self-esteem, songs that they, if they sing along to, they're automatically going to feel better about themselves. Uh, that's my side passion. And so I decided to put it into practice and use YouTube to, to get the music out there. But the thing with YouTube is that you have to make the content that performs well on the platform. So in, so if you were to look at the channel you'll see there's videos from years ago that were done purely out of passion and with no particular <laughs> no particular strategy behind them just you know just YouTube is just a great platform just simply for being able to easily publish videos and easily be able to go and watch them it doesn't always have to be about you know trying to go viral or anything uh, so, but in September, I decided, okay, let's let's do it properly. I had actually done one video properly, and when I say properly, again, inverted commas, because they're all proper, but as far as doing a highly polished video to the quality that it needs to be to actually have a chance of doing well on YouTube, and that was like a year prior, and that was live action, meaning actual real people, and I've got a green screen studio and filmed it. But it took so much time to put together and to edit. <laughs> to be honest, there's a second video that I never bothered editing. <laughs> I'll do it for clients, but for myself, it gets it gets left behind. And it was so involved and so time consuming. I thought, you know, realistically, I'm never going to do it this way. And then the other thing is, if you want to get children in the video, uh, there's all these legalities and paperwork around. You know, having children on the videos and all these hoops that you have to jump through. It just is too complicated. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to outsource it <laughs> and create an animated version of myself. So the interesting is, thing is that I did, I, I know what kind of content does well on YouTube and the strategy is basically to do that content interspersed with my own original music. So here's the thing. My songs, my original songs, will never, I don't want to say will never, maybe there'll be some sort of, you know, uh, out of the box, unexpected viral thing that happens with my original uh, songs, but that's not what I'm expecting and that's not how it works. But what does happen is everything does better because, because you do, of doing the stuff that could go viral. So that video that I did 
uh, the live action one did quite well, but that wasn't going to, I wasn't going to keep that up. That wasn't feasible for me. So I did the animated one and I did a finger family song because I know that that's one of the ones that performs well. It doesn't always perform well. It can be fickle sometimes on YouTube where it has its moments, but in general, that is a good song to do that. (laughs) <laughs> that does well that if you look at children's music, you'll see channels that have got <laughs> lots of different versions of Finger Family because it's done well for them. And so they double down and keep doing different versions of the same song. So that one, when I published it, it did really well straight away. And then and then it reached the point of uh, a few days in where it just took off and it hit like 200,000 views within uh, – just a very short time and and the subscriber count was climbing and if you looked at the at the stats at the back end you could see that basically for all year nothing much had happened and for the life of the youtube channel nothing much had happened and then boom it it took off and so i've been doing uh more songs in between i've done that's the one that's done the best I've also done, uh, did another Finger Family, <laughs> my Christmas version, and I did a Wheels on the Bus. And in between that, I have done, mainly because I've got the songs already already recorded, <laughs> I've done original songs. And so I've done my I'm Ready Now, which is a toilet training song, <laughs> which is if I do say so myself, the best toilet training song. <laughs> that I, I love. I, it's really fun. Like I actually want to dance to it. It doesn't make you think too much about Pooh and Wee. Although I think a song that talked about Pooh and Wee would be funny. Side note. Uh, and then the other song is Scrub-a-Dub-Dub, which is a bath time song, but it's original. So those funds have done relatively well. Maybe I should have got the numbers in front of me before I hit record. But anyway, they've done probably better than they would have if I hadn't done those other songs. So my point here is that if you're wanting to uh, take advantage of using YouTube's algorithm, that making the right content and finding out what the right content is that you need to make in your genre is key. So if you intersperse that with your content from the heart, then uh, that'll help lift everything and it'll help you be discovered. And your content from the heart will never perform as well as your content made for what does well on the platform. Hopefully you can do some sort of Venn diagram where you can find something that does both. Uh, But the content that you make and that you choose to make is important. Now, an interesting thing to note is that you can look into what gets searched for and factor that into some of the things as far as your SEO and your titles and things like that and what you might choose to make. But what I think is really interesting is that the biggest thing about YouTube that I've found when you're looking at the back end is that the majority of the views come from suggested content. That is, YouTube does the work for you. So they put it in front of people. For example, Finger Family, if you were searching on, say, you can use something like Google Trends and do compare different content ideas, and Finger Family does not rank that highly against some of the other options of songs that I could have made. It, other songs get searched for more. It's not that highly searched for. So why does it perform so well on YouTube? Because it's one that YouTube has decided performs well when people click on it. And so they are the ones that put it in front of people. It's not people searching for it. It is just content that they know does well if they shove it in people's faces. So that's key is finding out what is that content that does well on the pl- on the platform when YouTube gives people a chance to view it? The other thing you've got to think about is making a thumbnail that's enticing so that it'll make people uh, want to click on it in the first place. So having a great thumbnail and that, uh, that 
that evokes a cur- curiosity or interest or excitement or something is really important. And that's why you see, if you look through the thumbnails, you see these big, expressive, over-the-top faces and facial expressions because they do better than simply a pretty thumbnail. You know, it's got to be something that makes you go, why is that person pulling their face? You know, <laughs> or wow, I really want to click on that picture of Libby because her face is so, her smile is so huge and and that's what I want to uh, find out more about. So uh, thumbnails are really important. But yeah, I think one of the surprising things is how much the algorithm does it for you. So when uh, watching that these things happen on YouTube, it, it makes me uh, not prioritise too much sharing it on social media. It is nice if I get to do it, <laughs> but it's not when I'm because I'm doing this as a side thing in my spare time, and I uh, building up to a point where I can have the uh, time and resources and stuff to put out videos more often and you know at a faster rate it can take like a couple of months at the moment to get an animated video up to standard and published so it'll be nice if I could put them out uh, quicker but for the time being for it where I'm at I'm doing what I can but it's interesting you can still very clearly see what works and I wouldn't say what doesn't work but you can see how to grow it, you need to do that, that certain content that performs well. I, If you're looking at content and judging someone's YouTube and going, oh, that doesn't get too many views, that's okay. That doesn't mean they're not doing well because if they've got some that are, then they could well know that that there are certain videos that will do well and certain videos that won't, but they want to nurture the audience that does discover them. So, yeah, so even though not everything goes viral, that doesn't matter because if if people are discovering you and finding out about your channel, then the ones that that love you and discover you become your fans and watch that content, even if it's not made to go viral. Uh, But, yeah, for for sure, I see people uh, saying, please subscribe so I can hit my 1,000 subscribers to monetize and 4,000 hours watch time in a year. So... Uh, there are other benchmarks as well, but that was the one I was going for. And I didn't need to ask anyone to please subscribe. So that's not a huge, so that's interesting to me. It's the whole thing about really trying to push and promote and get people to subscribe. It is a drop in the ocean compared to what the algorithm itself does for you when it pushes your content out to the people who would be interested in it, who just subscribe without you having to ask. Oh, having said, don't ask. You, you still absolutely do within your video itself. Uh, because I'm doing kids' music, I don't so, so much, but I am experimenting with creating a little ending clip where the cute little character goes, subscribe! Or oh, something like that. <laughs> so yeah, you do ask people, but what I'm meaning is if you're on uh, social media and asking all your friends to subscribe, that is like a drop in the ocean compared to the effectiveness of actually just creating the right content that will do well on the platform. Uh, what else did I want to remember to tell you? So a couple of things. When it comes to doing, say, if you're doing a podcast and you want to put a podcast on a YouTube channel, you can either, if you're wanting to be like Diary of a CEO successful with it, if you're wanting it to be like Joe Rogan or or basically go viral, even if it's not a household name, it's pretty much unlikely to happen by just basically posting your videos there without a strategy. Uh, And it's not, I think it's brilliant that we can now use an RSS feed and definitely everyone should have their podcast on YouTube now because it's simple and easy and you can just do it with an RSS feed and push it out there and it boosts your overall podcast reach and discoverability and SEO. It is fantastic. But if you're talking about the whole YouTube pushing it out to 100,000 people or or whatever, something like that. From my experience, 
with YouTube, you still have to make the content that performs well on the platform and you have to grab people's attention. So this is something even with my uh, music videos, I have a, an opener uh, is before the song starts and it's the character Livy and it goes, Livy, and you hear some children's giggling and I did that as short as I possibly could. It's like one second. And then when the music starts and I've talked to the producer who makes the music and I've said, can you just take out the introduction? Can you just start? I just want, I don't want people to spend three seconds wondering what the song is. I want them to know <laughs> straight away, finger family, finger family or whatever. Like I want them to know instantly, is it what they're looking for? Uh, because you can lose people in the first three seconds. So uh, having it grab people's attention from the get-go is important. Uh, cutting out the waffle, having it visually interesting, all those sort of things are important if you're going to go the extra mile and also knowing what content to make. Cadence, cadence as far as how often you're doing it, is important too, something that's sustainable but frequent. So, yeah, but you've also got to do what you can. So I would like to, uh, down the track, incre increase my, my own cadence for my children's music channel, but I'm still finding results just from doing really high-quality songs that are the right content, that are super, super cute, uh, that have lots of expression, and that uh, have the smallest possible intro, especially for those viral songs, those potentially viral songs. Is there anything else? And then on the cherry on top is SEO. But when you're looking at viral stuff, that's kind of like the sm small percentage. What else? And then there's things like getting your shelves right, like the shelves on YouTube, making it nice and maybe having something at the top that you want as a featured video that you want them to see, putting in all the SEO and boosting your discoverability in every other way is important. But I think I think I have discussed the key things. Uh, and most of it comes down to making the right content and making it really high quality. Have you got any questions? If you do, please flick me an email or write it in the comments wherever you are and let me know and if you enjoyed listening to this i'd love to know who you are let me know by screenshotting on whatever platform you're listening on and tagging me on instagram and i'll see you in the next one bye i'm stepping in the next level me i'm here to be everything i can be like a snake i'm shedding my skin to be Hello, it's Libby here. Have you ever wondered about what the key elements are that make a podcast truly stand out? Or maybe you're thinking about starting your own special podcast and feel a bit overwhelmed and don't know where to start. Well, I have something for you. Introducing the ultimate podcast checklist. Da, 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 da. It's a step-by-step -step guide that covers everything from the initial brainstorming to advanced growth strategies. It's the perfect companion for both new and seasoned podcasters. And the best part, it's absolutely free. Da, 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 da. <laughs> to grab your copy, simply head to the show notes of this episode and you will find a direct link there and then away you go. Remember, every podcast started with that initial spark and the right resource. So let the ultimate podcasting checklist be yours.